The Florida Gators landed a commitment from Enoch Langley this weekend. We're going to talk about it here on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Gators, part of the Locked On Podcast and Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day every day. We are available daily and free for everybody to the podcast and on YouTube. Happy Monday. I'm Brandon Olson. Today's episode of Locked On Gators is read by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. And today we're talking about Enoch Wangoy, who um, committed to the Florida Gators rather unexpectedly on Saturday evening, Saturday night. Um, and he's, he's pretty much a relative unknown, right? And Florida Gators fans, especially on social media, um, we're, we're bashing that. And I'm just going to throw this one out there. I, I have a lot to say about it, but I'm going to throw this one out there, uh, because of social media, just absolutely dunking on him. Um, because, because like, it's not even anything about his play. It's just, oh, another European kid. Because you Noel know, Portnagan committed last year, or well, this past cycle, the 2024 class. Enoch Wangoy, Wangoy, is a British athlete that moved to the U.S. to play basketball, but picked up football last year. Noel Portnagan was a German athlete who played football in Germany. And it's coming to Florida to play football. There's there's a difference. There's some parallels, but there's a difference between that, right? Like like Enoch's in in Florida. He's in high school in Florida. Like he like he's there playing football in the United States. Uh, yes, he's initially from the UK, but but he's in Florida playing. Like he's an in-state kid at this point. So it's not like Noel Portnagan, who I don't care if you loved it or hated. I know that there's a, a lot of people that are like, oh well. He's playing in Germany. That's nothing compared to the U.S. And there were some people who were like, well, he's playing pros in Germany. That's something compared to the U.S. Uh, he's playing against grown men, whatever it is. But th- this is a different scenario. Um, and I will say that the Enoch Wangoy, I'm not going to pretend that I, I know a ton about him as a player. However, when I'm looking at this commitment, and obviously I know a lot of people want to be critical about it, and it's fair. If you do want to be critical, like, like that's fair. But to just go oh, another European kid is not really a fair criticism, right? Like, like th- that's not a fair critique of a kid. Like, oh, he's European, he can't be good. That's just not how it works. There's been plenty of international football players that have come over and found tremendous success in the U.S. So that doesn't really work that way, right? His measurables for Enoch Wangoy are listed inconsistently. And by that, I mean uh, his... Twitter profile, his Twitter bio says that he's 6'8", 280, um, with a seven-foot wingspan. On three has him listed as like 6'8", 265, or something like that. Um, and then in on three's reporting of the commitment, they said that he's currently uh, 6'7", 315, with a 7'2", and a quarter wingspan, whatever it may be. But this is one of those kids where we look at them and we say... He has elite athletic traits and tools that we're looking at. You look at that height compared to the NFL draft at offensive tackle. Compared to the NFL draft at offensive tackle, his height, whether he's 6'7 or 6'8, is somewhere between the 83rd and 94th percentile at the NFL combine. Okay? Of all offensive tackles from like 1988 or something like that. 83rd to 94th percentile. His weight. If he's that like 280 that he lists, or even if he's 265, like on three has on his profile, that's zero percentile. Zero. Again, I know that there's a lot of people who want to critique that. Like I know that I posted those numbers on Twitter on uh, Tuesday night, um, Tuesday night, Saturday night. (laughs) Um, And people were like, zero percentile? You can't play tackle at that weight. You can't. But guess what? 
he's not going to be that weight when he plays. Like, it's as simple as that. Like, yeah, he might be 280 now, but he's not going to be 280 when he gets on campus or when he actually puts the pads on in a game. He's not going to be 280, okay? So I don't care too much about the weight. Weight is something that you can change. You can't change height. You can't change wingspan or, well, it can change, but you can't change it. So weight, if he's listed as the 280 or if he is the 280 or even 265, they're on three has him, zero percentile. However, on three in their article, I forgot who wrote it, but when they wrote it, they said that he's currently 6'7", 315. If he's 315 pounds, that's 56th percentile in the NFL combine for offensive tackles specifically. That's 56th percentile already, and he's still got another year of high school and then college. So he's either at zero percentile, which isn't a concern because there's plenty of time to gain weight, gain weight or he's 56th percentile, which for a freshman is pretty damn good. Obviously, you also have to consider that he's significantly taller than most true freshman offensive tackles, and so that the weight distribution will be differently, and you want him to be in a heavier percentile. You want him to be closer to his height. But being at 56 as a, as a jump point with, again, another year in high school and then college, that's a fine spot to be in. It doesn't concern me. Jenny, even if it's zero, it doesn't concern me right now, considering what we're looking at, where it's long term. Wingspan. He's listed as having, his Twitter says, seven foot wingspan. And in on three's reporting, they put that he has uh, seven foot two and a quarter wingspan, which puts him around 80 second if it's seven foot and 95th percentile if it's seven two and a quarter yeah like that's what we're talking about when we talk about this commitment i'm not saying that this is a commitment that makes or breaks your program it's not however i'm talking about you're looking at a kid who's got elite athletic traits again this is a basketball player that's learning how to play football and wants to play football like so, so he he's a giant already and he's got the athletic traits and he's a good basketball player like i just want to say that when i was watching his highlights which i know highlights are highlights but i feel like basketball is a bit different um but he's got those elite athletic traits with a very high ceiling he's just learning how to play football again like so he's got all that height that length the athleticism and no technique like that means that you're looking at some and i don't mean no technique in the sense of he he's just bad and he's been doing it like like he's not someone who's been playing football since he was a kid and get it no he just started playing football what seven months ago that means that you can look at dramatic leaps in development that's what we talk about when we talk about jakeem jackson for example he moved from wide receiver to corner and we're expecting him to take these big leaps because he's got the athletic traits that you look at and he's just learning how to play the position. And we go, all right, well, you've got the athletic traits. You're learning how to play. Once you piece up some of the technique things, you're going to take a big jump because your athleticism is going to help you anyway. And that's how I'm looking at Enoch Wangnoy. Okay. I'm not saying he's going to be, you know, an all American offensive tackle. He might be, he might not be. But it's fair to go, all right, you got the, the elite traits, which we know that Florida looks for the athletes. Like, that's a thing that Florida has always done, especially with their, their front office style uh, approach that they like to call it of, of evaluating and bringing in kids. They look for those elite athletic traits. And just learning how to play football means that you can look at those dramatic leaps in development. And if he takes one of those leaps going into his senior year of high school, he's going to have a lot more competition for his signature for Florida. But this is this is a good ad. Like, like don't don't make it a habit to bring in kids who are just learning how to play football and, and that are very raw and have high bust potential. Because again, e Enoch could work out perfectly fine. He could be really good. He could be he could be really bad. He could be like, you know, this isn't for me, and it and it won't work out at all. But you're looking at a high upside player with elite with elite athletic tools. It's a good ad. Don't make it a habit of adding like, you know, add one to two of those guys. One to two in a class is fine with me. I have no issue with that. Don't make it too many. But bringing that in, like, I'm not going to hate on this at all. You brought in a kid who's unranked. He's going to be at the bottom of your class and has the potential to be a really good football player. Again, you got to put together a lot of tools, and it's going to take some time. But 
you're not expecting anything from him for a few years anyway. So why would anybody have a real issue with it? We'll talk more about, about this ad. And, and I do I do like the approach with some of it. And, and I do want to explain that one. First, we're going to get a quick word from Amazon Fire. Fire TV is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. And Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick, which is what I have plugged into the back of my TV in my living room. Just saying. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball, which is right around the corner and I can't wait, or the college basketball tournament, which um, we'll talk about later. I'm going to be heartbroken. You're going to want to have Fire TV, right? Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive in with all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on the latest in the world of sports, whether that's March Madness, NBA, MLB, hell of a lot more. Not to mention great news, uh, entertainment, gaming, cooking, tra- cooking, travel videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Just trust me on this. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. And today's episode of Locking It is also brought to you by Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry when you buy tickets to see your next big event, whatever that may be, right? Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. I got to get me up to a concert. All right, it's been a while. Uh, last concert I went to was, jeez, Drake and Future <laughs> I'm in like 2016 or 2017. It's been a while. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, view from your seats, and the best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. It's how I went to the Arkansas game at Florida uh, November 4th, which was just, just, they, I mean, what a waste that was, right? Just, uh, man, I spent money to watch that. That was, that was horrible. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you the complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the view from your seats before you buy, so you know exactly where you're sitting. All in prices show you your total upfront, so like you're not like, oh, this is a fantastic deal, and then the fees cost an insane amount of money. No, no, no. And you can buy tickets in two steps, or just two, two taps, two taps. That's it. Just tap it in. That's it. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. And use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, let's create an account and redeem code Locked On L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time today. Last minute tickets. Lowest price guaranteed. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcasts. And I, I wanted to continue talking about Enoch Langoy for a little bit, but also not directly about him. Because I do understand where some fans get frustrated with, with these kinds of additions and commitments. And I get it. They may seem odd. But at the same time, let's, let's talk about Enoch, but not Enoch, if that makes sense. It's pretty much the general consensus that hey, we don't really want to see true freshmen playing a tackle, right? I can't remember the last time the Florida Gators brought in a high school tackle and we were all pretty much just like, oh yeah, like this is, he's our starter from, from day one and he's going to be a good starter at that. It's not just like, oh, our tackles really suck, um, which is what anybody would have said. Anybody that wanted Fletcher Westfall to start this year I'm not saying that those people even exist. I haven't seen that take really, but anybody that did want it probably would have been because our tackles really suck. Like that would have been the approach. Not that you think he's going to be amazing because you just don't expect a true freshman to come into the SEC and play well, right? You need a lot of work, development, technique, your your weight, your strength room is really going to play a part in that, okay? So if you're going to swing on a prospect, that you're just like, maybe we strike out. Maybe we hit a freaking home run, and it's just going to be whatever it may be. Enoch Langway is kind of the kind of player that you want to swing on there, right? Enoch's just starting to play football. Again, like I mentioned last segment, that means that the door is open for leaps in development. Okay? 
So just starting to play football, doors open for leaps in development. NFL high percentile height and wingspan. So size is there. You got to get weight up, but you always got to do that with an offensive tackle anyway, right? So when, when you're looking at that and you also then look at premium position. Uh, we, we've talked about the premium positions a lot. Uh, they, they're kind of, they change frequently, but one thing that kind of always stays the same is QB, pass catcher, offensive tackle, pass rusher, cover man, right? Some people want to put center as like the next most important or defensive tackle as the next most important safety, whatever it may be. But you look at those premium positions, that's where you swing. You don't swing on a, this guy could be a, a generational nose tackle. Like that's just not a swing that people take because the, the gap between generational and really freaking good isn't that big at nose. When you look at tackle, it is. QB, it is. Receiver, it is. Like those kinds of jumps. So if you're going to swing on a player where you go, hey, maybe he doesn't work out at all. Maybe he becomes all-American caliber, really good, soon to be in the NFL player. That That's what you swing at. So you're looking at a guy who, again, weight is like the main thing people can talk about, but he's got another year of high school. And then you don't expect a guy to play as a true freshman at offensive tackle. So he's got two years to gain that weight, two years to develop technique as a tackle, two years to develop anything. You're fine with it. Like that's who you swing on. So I get it. There's plenty, there is plenty of criticism to give for the Florida Gators. Even if you want to circle back to Noah Portnagan from last year, he plays guard. You don't like, like, you don't have many generational guards that are going, okay, they're taking our, our team to the next level. That's just not a common thing in modern football anymore. There's the generational guards like Quentin Nelson and a few other guys, but like it's just not a common thing in modern football. So like you can critique the Noel Portnagan one more than this one, I think, because you're at least swinging at a premium position. And as far as like I keep seeing people on, on Twitter and in Discord and everything where they go, well, they won't hear they won't be here to develop these guys if they don't win some games. Sure. But what the hell kind of thought process is that? Because guess what? They could bring in the top 10 kids in the entire 2025 cycle. And they won't be here to develop them if they don't win games. So it doesn't matter if you're swinging high, swinging low, whatever it is. It doesn't matter if you're if, if you're swinging or bunting at all on these kids. If you go, well, don't bother bringing in the high upside kids that need work because you're not going to be here if you don't win games. At that point, which your dumb opinion, because that is a dumb, like there's no other way to say it. Like there's just no other way to say it. Like I, I can't get over that opinion that people keep going. Like, why are you bringing in these high, these high uh, potential kids that need a lot of work? You're not going to be here to develop them if you lose. If that's how you feel, then just say, hey, man. Don't recruit a single player. Don't have a single visit. Don't go to a single high school game. Don't do a single thing. Focus on winning football games this year. That's it. Just then we'll worry about recruiting whenever we can, right? But you got you to solidify this. because Do you, you see how brain dead that sounds? Because that's really what you're saying when you go, oh, yeah, don't bother bringing in the guys that can be home run hits. Again, could be nothing. Could be absolutely nothing. Could not want to play football at all. But to go, oh, don't bother bringing them in because they need work and you're not going to be here for that anyway. Then don't bring in anybody. Don't bring in DJ Lagway. Don't bring in LJ McCray. Sure, they're more refined, but they're going to need work and development before they're really ready to be big time SEC impact players. And if you think they're not going to be here, then just call it. Just chalk it because it's done anyway. We we know how stupid that sounds, right? Like that that's... That, that's hitting home right like, like you can't go oh yeah don't bring in these don't bring in these high ranking or don't bring in these uh high ceiling kids with work don't do it because you're not going to be here so why not like why don't even show up to coach why you're not going to be here don't even show up to coach that's a bad opinion and i know that there's people that go oh like there's no such thing as bad opinion that's a bad opinion that one that is a bad opinion unequivocally like you can't you can't argue it you can't debate it you can't justify it that's a bad opinion you bring in players who you can hit home runs with, okay? You bring in players who can become 
all SEC players. You bring in players who can become all American players. You swing. And I'll say this as well. Like I know that I have plenty of criticisms for Billy Napier and this staff. And I have plenty of criticisms for Rob Sale. And, and, and but I mean, so much that the hiring Jonathan DeCoster, I've had plenty of criticism, plenty of critique about it, right? And, and in terms of whether they're good enough or not, who's to say? But I will say that I don't have a single concern about whether or not they're willing to swing and at least try to make things happen here. So I'm, I'm never going to, I'm not going to bash a higher, uh, uh, an addition like this. Again, if you bring in a couple in a cycle, that's fine. Don't make it too much of a habit where that's half your class or anything. But if you bring in a, a, an addition like this where the kid can, can hit and can be an absolute diamond, I'm not going to bash that. And like they're still swinging on those kids because they understand you need some of those on top of having the, the blue chip players that you have to bring in, right? So I'm not going to bash this hire at all or bash this addition at all because it's one of those ones where you swing. You get two or three a cycle as in swings in general. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I'm not going to bash you for, for taking that swing. Go ahead. I have no problem. Be Javi Baez. I don't care. Just you either you're either hitting the dinger or you're striking out. Do it. Like like go for it. With, with an addition like this, I'm fine with it. Uh, we do have to talk about the basketball team, which by the way, is going to be the death of me. They're gonna kill me. They're gonna kill me. We'll talk about them in just a second. But first, a quick word from LinkedIn. Today's episode of Locked On Gators is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business SEC program, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role, right? That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs is a tool to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. And LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire, right? Gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive for you. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. Again, more than a billion professionals. It's so easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. And LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to really do your due diligence with these hires. So LinkedIn's constantly trying to find ways to make the process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions so it makes it easier and quicker for you, right? 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. This isn't a flash in the pan kind of thing. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. Thanks again for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast and on YouTube. Uh, and to wrap up today's show, we're talking about the basketball team because again, they hate me and I kind of hate them now. Like that's what, that's what we're doing. Uh, if you don't know, the Florida Gators lost 79-78 to Vanderbilt on Saturday, which Again, if you don't pay attention to college basketball, Vanderbilt basketball is like Vanderbilt football. Like they're not a they're not a good program. Uh they're nine and twenty-one to end the year now, nine and twenty-two. Um, so yeah, that that's where they're at. And I, I will say, I feel like I've been fairly adamant that this team confuses me and drives me up a wall because they're built to make a run. Like you look at the roster makeup. They've got the bigs that get them the offensive rebounds. They've got the bigs and all the players really that get to the free throw line. They've got shooting throughout and they've got guard, like good guards. And so you look at that and you look at those, those are the four factors, by the way, like those are the four factors that Todd Golden really cares about. Three point attempted rate, free throw rate, turnover percentage, um, and effective field goal percentage. Those are the main four. And Todd Golden loves those. And he's built a team that's, that's theoretically, on paper, good there, right? But they are so inconsistent that it worries me. And I, it's what I've been saying when we talk about how deep of a run can they make in, in March Madness is I'm not sure. Like, if you can make it to the second weekend, that's incredible. If you can win one game and make it to the second round, I'm happy. Because I don't have that. I, I, going into this year, I said my expectation 
is make the tournament and I'm happy. Okay. Going into the season, that was that. So like, if you make the tournament and you lose, that's not going to ruin my expectation or my view of this team. Cause that's what I expected of them going into the year. But when you look at how this team's made good guard play and in, in, in March madness, good guard play takes teams farther than anything else. Right. Florida should have that. The Zion Poland, Walter Clayton Jr. But man, this team, they're just so inconsistent. They can't go against it. And I said it after the Vanderbilt game, the first one, when Florida won it. I said, when you play against a team that's better than Vanderbilt and they run that trap and they press you like that, they're going to beat you because of that. Like, you're going to lose. You're going to fall to that because you can't beat it against Vanderbilt. You can't beat it against a good team. And then you lost to Vanderbilt doing it. Like, it, it was just incredible to me that they couldn't beat the Jerry Stackhouse 2024 Vanderbilt Commodores in the second time around. Why? And, like, I, I'm very openly the type where I don't blame a game on the refs. I don't care if the refs do a horrible job or a great job. I won't blame the game on them in either direction. And I still don't do that for Vanderbilt. Did the refs screw up? Yeah. Did they blow a bad whistle or or make a couple of no whistles? Sure, yeah. However, Vanderbilt never should have been in that game. So I don't care that the refs screwed a call late in the game and Vanderbilt won. I don't give a damn because Vanderbilt never should have been in that game. It's the same I, approach I take to the, to the Marco Wilson shoe throw game. Yeah, Marco Wilson throwing the shoe probably cost the game. However, Florida was a much better team than LSU that year. That was a bad LSU team. You should have never been in that position where you needed that. And I understand your LSU, that game's always tough. I get that. That was a game that never should have been close like that. So I don't. that's why I don't blame Marco Wilson. It's, it was a stupid boneheaded move, and that would, absolutely, that would absolutely matter to me if I was an NFL team drafting a kid. But as far as is that why you lost the game, it contributed. But again, never should have been in that position. That's how I feel about the Vanderbilt whistle. Vanderbilt, a, a, t- a team that, that is known for running small, often runs lineups with four guards or, or like, like three guards, a small forward and, and a big. Season high number of offensive rebounds against the Florida Gators on Saturday. Their season high. Came against Florida, one of the best offensive rebounding teams, a great rebounding team that just was playing soft on Saturday on the boards. Second half, Vanderbilt just dominated Florida on the boards. Those are the second most points that, that Vanderbilt scored all season. Their most was at the 85 against Arkansas, but second most points that Vanderbilt scored all season. Came against the Florida Gators on Saturday. And you got dominated on the boards. In the second half, Vanderbilt consistently got into the paint and made their layups, got the free throw line, whatever it was. Against a small team, they had success against you on the boards and in the paint. Good luck in the tournaments, man. Because, like, that that's pitiful stuff. And, again, this is something that we've been talking about for a while here now, where this team gives me genuine concerns about how deep of a run they can make because on paper they're built to do that, but they constantly do things. Like you had a 12-point lead against Vanderbilt. You blew it. This team loves to loves to just hand victories away when they have double-digit leads. This team, I mean, Walter Clayton Jr. with that turnover on the inbound. Like I blame him for, for a terrible inbound, but also why is he there? I feel like he's consistently been bad at inbound. And why do we give it to him? Just because he's a guard? Like, is that it? Is it that he's a, he's a guard? And we're just like, oh, he could definitely inbound? Because a lot more goes into inbounding than just, oh, can you make the physical pass? So, like, yeah, he screwed up by turning that over, but also, like, why? he shouldn't have been in that position. Simple as that. Like, like similar to football, the Arkansas game. Yeah, you could blame Trey Smack for missing a 44-yard field goal, but he never should have been in that position. It should have been a 39-yard field goal. But coaching lets you down there, and that's what happened, I think, in, in the Vanderbilt game. And then, of course, the, the end of the game was just the, uh, the the last possession. First off, the inbound play on the last possession where the refs stopped it for, for no apparent actual reason. Um, Florida started their inbound set, and then when it came to – and then they blew the whistle, which no timeout, nothing. And then – Florida tried running the same thing, but it's like Vanderbilt then knew what Florida was trying to do on that play. And it was just wild. It was just wild. 
And like, I knew that the intensity from the Alabama game last week wasn't going to carry over because, and I said this in the post game live stream, like it, it would be awesome to see that intensity every game, but there's not a team on the planet. I think that can bring that intensity into every game. It's not just about whether or not you're good enough. It's that there was a lot for that game from that Alabama game. The first time they played going into the second time, there was a lot behind that for Florida. And that's the kind of stuff that you can't replicate every game. Even if you're the best coach, you can't replicate that kind of intensity every game. But I didn't expect them to just roll over and die on Saturday. And that's what they did. They just went out of Vanderbilt, go ahead, do whatever you want. We beat Alabama. We're good. We'll end the season on our on one and two in our last three with a loss to South Carolina win against Alabama and then a loss to Vanderbilt. Man, it's fine. Like, what the hell? Dude, that's just – I don't know how, how deep of a run this team can make because they're too inconsistent for me to say I can gauge anything. If they're hot in the tournament, hell yeah, they can make a run. But are we going to rely on that? Because that's just wild. Like, it's going to be at least a fun march where they're going to be in tournaments and it's going to be fun. But, man, uh, I am ready to be hurt again. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free for in the podcast. We'll be back to talk more Florida Gators football tomorrow. For Locked On Gators, I'm Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with Giants Country and NFL 33, and I'll see you all next time.